Welcome to season two of the Fashion and Color Podcast, your favorite and soon to be number one fashion podcast in the world. I want to invite you to step into our space where dynamic conversations with the most creative designers, trailblazers, and those influencing fashion. This podcast was inspired by our groundbreaking book, Fashion and Color, Volume 1, which is a celebration and preservation of the rich history of Black designers who have shaped the fashion industry. Remember, please support designers of color. Let's get into this week's episode. I am so excited to be here with someone who has inspired me personally. She is a fashion icon. She is a judge on Project Runway. She's an author, she's a mom, she's a wife, she's a philanthropist, she's a writer. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and on. Uh, welcome, Elaine Waterrock. Thank you for having oh, me. I'm such like a reunion. I did a reunion. I've known you for so many years. Time. Like uh, since the very beginning uh, yeah. of Harlem Fashion Row. Yeah. Yeah. Which was, how long ago was that? 10 years at least? Yeah, over 10 years. Over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, but we honored you in 2016. Oh my goodness. I yes. have this like thing with who we honor and what year and what we gave them. It's like a... It's like literally ingrained. I know what you mean my... because I remember covers like that. Yeah. From Teen Vogue. Yeah. yeah, yeah. First, how are you doing? I'm so good. I'm so good. It feels like it. Yeah. Every time I look at your social, I was like... It just feels like you're at such this really great place in life. I feel that way. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm, I, I, it's nice to know that is that emanates yeah, through the energy. You the, feel the, it. The internet. You feel it. But no, I really feel like I'm in such a good place in yeah. my in my whole life, like yeah. in my family life, in my professional life, my relationship with myself. This yeah. is the first time I've ever had a hobby, girl, in What's my your adult hobby? life, playing tennis. <laughs> I am about, like literally I talk I so much can I say shit? I talk yeah. so much shit on the tennis court. You, I be thinking I'm Serena. I am the next Serena. I am coming for you, Serena. Okay. Oh my I love I love it. And so I think for the first time in my life I really feel a sense of balance. Right. That I've never really had before. Mm. And I think that has given me a sense of grounding and just peace. Yeah. And also more energy reserves that I can draw from. So all around, I'm feeling I'm feeling good. I think we motherhood did that. It. Motherhood definitely does that. Yeah. I think age too. Because yeah. you get to a place where you're like striving and striving and striving. And then finally you're like... You hit a flow. Yeah. I can actually rest. Yeah. I can relax. Also, moving to LA did a lot <sighs> for the mind, body, spirit. And I know it's so cliche. Like I never thought I would mm -hmm. be that girl, mm -hmm. you know, who's repping LA. Right. I feel like I'm like, damn, did I really trade teams? Because I still rep Brooklyn. Yeah. And I still rep the Bay, which is where I'm from. But yeah. coming to L.A., I don't know if it was, again, the age thing, like you yeah. said, like, you know, hitting mid-30s, yeah. kind of coming out of the pandemic, yeah. you know, moving to a place that's filled with light, that gives yeah. you more spaciousness, that gives you more of a connection to nature. Um, People value balance more here, too. They do. They do. They just do. A hundred percent. It's not like a hustle culture. It, it's also, I don't even know what the culture is here because yeah. I don't leave my house, Brandon. It's like, I, that's the best, like, unless I am being paid, uh -huh. I pretty there. much, I create my sanctuary at yeah. my home and then I travel for work and I, yeah. but I come back to the sanctuary and I think that's what I never had in New York. In yeah. New York, you live in the streets. You live right? in the streets. Like you, yeah. you the, you're yeah. like living and breathing yep. the culture in the streets and yep. you're always out, you're always engaging with people and, and that does feed you, you yeah. know, creatively. But it also drains you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yes. that far. Yeah. You need a balance. You need a mix of both. You have to have a balance. Um, one of the first questions I wanted to ask you because it is something that I have looked at for years mm. in your career is there was a time when black editors would leave a very high post mm -hmm. and we didn't know where they went mm. after that, right? There was like, no, here's my next. And when I saw you transition from Teen Vogue it was like, okay, now she's on Project Runway. Now she's writing this amazing book. Now, you know what I mean? Did you have it mapped out? Like, what was kind of, like, what helped you to go from being an editor 
mm -hmm. to being this multi-hyphenate? Well, I would just say that being an editor gives you so many transferable skills that apply in so mm -hmm. many different career paths. You can do anything. If you can, if you can be an editor in chief, you can be anything. Truly. Wow. Um, and I want to shout out my mentor, Harriet Cole, who I always talk yes. about because she did what I did before mm. I did it. Mm. Um, she just did it before the age of social media where you're right. able to broadcast your journey. But I, I, I watched how she moved. She was my first boss. I stalked her and I saw, you know, I, when I discovered her kind of blueprint, even at 19 years old, when I was coming out of college, mm -hmm. I read about how she started her career in magazines and used that as a launching pad to do so many other things. And I thought that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't for me um, that I, I just wanted to be a magazine editor and that was it. Right. I came into that career with an end game in mind. I came into that career knowing it would be the first career mm -hmm. of many iterations of my evolution. And I think that that mindset is very contemporary, actually. It's very yeah. much the way that young people today yep. should be and are thinking about their careers in the future. Yeah. Because what we know is this world is changing so quickly yeah. and you have to be poised for evolution, for change, for the pivot. Like yep. you have to anticipate it. You have to be you have to be plotting it, the yep. two steps ahead, you know? And and I don't think I think we limit ourselves when we think about our careers in this linear yeah. sense or when we put ourselves in these boxes like i always knew i was going to be more than a beauty and more than a beauty editor when i was a beauty editor i knew i was going to be more than an editor-in-chief when i was an editor-in-chief i always saw what was next even if other people didn't see it for me and i think that's why maybe other people were more surprised right, and like right wow how did you i'm like girl i was <laughs> i was waiting for the i i i was waiting for the moment like i right I, and i'm not saying that like you know i th i think Every minute that I spent and every job I've ever had was incredibly valuable right. and I was picking up tools that I would need for the next. And I really learned that from Harriet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's she kind of laid that foundation for me. And I always joke that she was the original multi-hyphenate before multi-hyphenating was. was a thing. was, absolutely. You know, by the way, you absolutely. remind me of her. I don't even told you that, but just looking at really? you. Oh my God, you so I remind me of her. I love her so much. You I have, have so many Harriet ethics. stories. Do you? Oh my gosh. Harriet saved me in LA one time. Did she? For a fashion show. Yeah, we, were trying, to, we were trying to do this runway through a pool. Oh Lord, of course you were. Girl, it wasn't working, okay? <laughs> And Harriet was she there said it wasn't working. on another job, and she looked at me, and I was, people don't, on days of shows, I am the most calm person in the building. Oh, I love that. I can't explain it, but it's like, at that point, I've like surrendered. Like, yes. I've done all the work, and then I've just surrendered it. But that day, Harriet said to me, she said, Brandis, if they're not done in 20 minutes, you're going to do this runway show around the pool. Now, she knew there was no way they were going to be done in 20 minutes. But she also had the grace to give me like right. that, you know. Right. And so I just, yeah, that's, that's, she she that is literally so saved me that day. She she doesn't even, she, she doesn't know how not to mentor. Like, that's yeah. just who she is, yeah. everybody around her. Yeah. And she's so, she's so graceful with it. She is. Because yeah. as she said, Brand is just... Don't do it. Right. Like, just, I would have, something in you me would have pushed back. Yes. But the You're fact like, that she was like, thing. give it 20 minutes. Yeah. And I was like, oh, so good. Yeah. Speaking of her, I know in your book you talk about a lot of, I call them cliff jumps and risks that oh, you take. I love in, that. You know? Term, cliff jump. What are that. some of the big risks that you've taken? Because I don't think people realize that in order to get where you want to go sometimes there's going to be uncertainty yeah you won't have the answer there won't be a like yes this is going to work out perfectly yeah i mean i've so much of what i've done has probably been considered by somebody a risk mm -hmm. um i don't know that i think about the cliff jumps that i take as risks necessarily i think um my faith is what carries me mm -hmm. so um, I never feel like I'm free falling, you know, right. I feel like even if it looks like it to somebody else. So, but, but there's so many risks that I've taken over my career from throughout my career and throughout my life from moving from the Bay area to New York city right. on an internship that paid $10 an hour, wow. um, that I was supposed to stay at for a summer 
and then conned my way in to stay in forever. <laughs> right. And, you know, that was a major risk. Yeah. But I didn't think of it like that because I was so excited about right. what was on the other side of it. You right. know, it was pulling me. Right. I dreamed of that kind of an opportunity. And, it, and when it came, I was like, let's go. You right. know, I'm so ready. And I remember, you know, a fun, like a funny story that I don't think I've ever said is that I've shared is when I moved to New York that summer for a summer internship, mm -hmm. I changed my phone number to from 510 to a 917 number. Wow. And it was sort of this contract I was making with the universe, like, oh, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going back. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I just knew it. I knew that I knew that I knew, and I just right. manifested it in every way, including my phone number. Right. So, um, and I did. I ended up staying, and then I made another risk when I, I, I literally conned my way into staying longer because um, they forgot to tell me to leave. Um, on the last day of my internship. Uh -huh. And so I just kept coming and then I stayed on the payroll because no one caught that. I right. wasn't supposed to be there. So months down the line, I decide I'm gonna change my title. I'm gonna change my title. On this. I mean, like, why would I not? I'm here, I'm doing a job, I'm right. getting paid. Right. It's beyond the internship right. term. So I changed my title uh -huh. and then I had the audacity and this is some real millennial like when I look back I was like wow like who oh would I'm God. not that girl uh -huh. but I went up in there and I negotiated a promotion for a job I did not even have wait like wait 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 like so you took okay so you you promoted in the recession. so you promoted yourself from intern to this new role mm -hmm. and you production were production assistant production assistant mm -hmm. and then you were negotiating from production assistant to something else well then I no I just negotiated a pay raise to, to match oh, the to match the production assistant. Assistant. you're like yes. this is my new role yeah. that I've given myself that I've been doing yeah <laughs> little did you know <laughs> like who does that? You? I, apparently, young me, young me. I'm not that bold anymore. And this is when I worked for Harriet. Okay. And so you can imagine, I mean, the way that she looked at me, I thought I ruined my life. I really, really thought twice about every, oh every life decision I had made to that point. But then she made some phone calls and she granted me this promotion gracefully, wow. graciously. Right. And she said, don't ever do that again. Right. <laughs> she said, don't try that but again. That's right. Goes back to the pool story. Exactly. But you know, that was a risk. Yeah. And she encouraged it. Yeah. She said it was smart, actually. Right. She said what she said, don't ever do that again. But what you did was smart. Wow. Because we need what you're doing. Right. So right, it, it, right. It, you know, thankfully you it worked. Your own role. That felt like a risk. Let me tell you that. I thought I ruined my life. The night before, I was like, what have I done? Right. Oh, because I took a, anyway, there's a whole long story behind that. But anyway, that felt like a risk. Um, I think any new thing mm. feels a little risky, you right. know, um, even big, good things yeah. feel risky. When I got that first big job at Teen Vogue as the beauty director mm. and all these headlines went out saying I was the first black beauty Did director you expect in that? Conde history. Did Not you expect at all. Wow. When, when a black woman goes to interview for a job, let, especially a dream job, you're not thinking about, am I making history? Mm. You're thinking about how do I do an excellent job? How right. do I get this job, right. first of right. all? Um, and so that layer of this sort of history making kind mm. of title that came with this new job really profoundly shifted how I approached my work. Mm. Because I think, up into, I think up into that point, I was taking fewer risks mm. in the work. I was just trying to be you know, trusted, right. respected. I was playing by the rules. I was trying to, I was trying to fit into the box of right. this editor role in New York City, and there was a lot to live up to, and it's not what I came from. Right. And so, I think I, I, I call it. I was in my assimilation syndrome. Mm. And once that title hit with that headline, with the history making headline, I thought, wait a minute now, I'm doing a disservice right. to all the people that. I'm here to represent if right. I don't if I don't show up fully as me and bring more of that into yeah. the work and infuse that sort of into the mission that I uniquely bring. Right. And I think from that point forward, I started taking different types of risks in those 
seat right, that I was right. sitting in. And I think that really changed the trajectory of my career. And it set the stage for everything that I've done since Teen Vogue, you know, really yeah. using a sense of mission um, to really infiltrate fashion and infiltrate right. beauty, infiltrate entertainment um, in these kind of subversive ways where, you know, you could put lipstick on it. Absolutely. And, and it could walk yep. through the door, which may otherwise be closed to you, yeah. you know? And so I sort of learned how to how to marry like yeah. message um, and mission and purpose yeah. with what's you know culturally relevant and what feels fresh and fashion forward and yeah. so even when I you know when I left Teen Vogue and I did took on um, Project Runway I really said like I'm not a capital F fashion girl mm. I am in fashion but not of it right I'm here with a different perspective and I don't I actually was like I'm not going to do the show unless that you, that's welcome here if right. that's what you want and they were like that's why we came to you wow what you did at Teen Vogue is what we want you to bring here wow. and so it really felt it felt really significant and very, it was something that I felt proud of that I was able to leave Teen Vogue not only better than when I came to it but also it it, it was like a calling card for me like mm -hmm. this is what I stand for this right. is what this is what I want to do more about in the right. world. And um, at the time, that was very, that was something that, that resonated. Yeah. And so I felt really lucky to be in a position where I could translate that in a lot of different ways. And so people already knew when they were, when you were coming through the door, yeah. they knew what they were getting. Yeah. They knew. When you look kind of at the fashion industry now and what it was when you were there mm -hmm. and what it is now, do you feel like we've made progress? Do you Absolutely. feel like there's... I do. I, in okay. some ways I do, in other ways I don't. In, okay. in some ways I feel... So it feels really good to see that there are so many black editors now right. that are thriving. Right. You right. have Samira right. at Bazaar. Yep. You have you have so many black editors just all throughout the industry and on the mainstream right. side of things. I, I didn't have that. When you had that role, it was... I feel like it was you and there was someone at Brides. Yeah, and even at that, even while I was at Teen Vogue, she hadn't, she left. She yeah. Wasn't, she wasn't there anymore. Yeah. So I can't remember if there was anybody else. I don't know if there, I don't think there was anyone else. Yeah. I think it, you were it. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was a, it was kind of a lonely, um, yeah. lonely, you know, territory, I would yeah. say. But I, if I were there now, I would be able to look to my left and my right. And see and, so many and people. And see so many. So I think that's improved. Um... But you know, the state of the world is, we're in a regression in every yeah, way. We absolutely. are culturally moving backwards. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, while there may be more of us in these seats of power, um, if you are to talk to them, I, I think that they're facing probably some of the same challenges yeah. that I faced and that Harriet faced, um, you know, the generation that came before us. And so, you know, but fashion is, always a mirror of the times absolutely so you if you want to know where we are in any regard including racial diversity and progress and equity you look to fashion yeah and you can see a reflection of where we are and i think right now when you look at the runways you can see you can see it. there's a disappearance again you can absolutely of, of us on yeah. the runways and i will say there's more black designers who are right. who are prominent who needs so much more support who needs so yeah. much more support mm -hmm. but at least they have the visibility yes and they have businesses that yeah. are you know in stores yep. like neiman marcus where you're yep. going to speak yeah. next and and that's yeah. really i think a result of a lot of the work that you've put in yeah. um there are different organizations that are really focused and have been on not just celebrating but actually investing in Absolutely. and lifting up black fashion designers. It is It is so necessary. Um, I'm gonna go back to when you were an editor because I speak to so many editors. People feel stuck, Elaine. Mm. There are so many people that feel like, I don't know where to go next. Mm. Was there ever a time throughout your career where you felt stuck or you felt like you had on golden handcuffs or you felt like, or maybe you even wanna share like, a challenge mm -hmm. just so that people know that the road so is like here it's like this oh my god you know are you kidding 
How much time you got? Let's put something stronger in my green juice. Um, oh my gosh, there was nothing but challenges along the way. Nothing but challenges along the way. I, I, um, Do you have starting one specific Ebony, story you could share with us? I will just say starting at Ebony at a black magazine, working in a beauty and style mm -hmm. capacity, you are quite literally at the very bottom of the hierarchy. So I had to fight tooth and nail for every single thing that was handed to the next editor on a silver platter. Mm. I had to fight for respect, for resources, for access. Um, Ebony was not given seats at shows. I mean, we weren't given access backstage. We didn't have the budget to have camera crews and you know videographers. So I had to be scrappy and and find friends with video cameras and convince my boss to let me do it and then convince the people backstage to let us in to get these interviews to put us on the map mm -hmm. to establish us like and in a way that was great experience right. for what it takes to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. you know you it, it it allowed me the opportunity to cultivate an entrepreneurial spirit from within right. this legacy brand that meant so much to yeah. our community. Absolutely. But didn't mean so much to anyone else. Right. Especially in this fashion world. So right. I think navigating that sort of rarefied space mm -hmm. with a chip on my shoulder mm -hmm. was a huge challenge for me. Um, wanting to feel proud right. of our culture and this magazine that represents so much for us, but then recognizing how little the rest of the world valued mm -hmm. it and us. Um, I, I think, you know, and then moving to Glamour, which is my next role and realizing, oh my God, there's entire departments with 15 people doing what I was doing by myself. Wow. And so that, it was sort of bittersweet because yeah. it was sort of like, well, damn, I was doing, I was doing 20 people's jobs. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I feel good about myself, but also, wow, we deserve so much better. Why are we doing so much with so little? Right. You know, and it sort of reflected this larger systemic imbalance and Gosh. inequity that you see in every industry. Absolutely. Right. But we're, but we are the ones at the forefront of culture. We make everything look good. Yeah. We make everything yep. trend. We make everything fly yep. and we get the least. Yeah. back from the culture and so i think that um just as a black woman and as somebody in the space trying to you know represent our culture mm -hmm. was that was super challenging and then going to glamour and teen vogue and these mainstream magazines and recognizing that they needed what mm -hmm. we had mm -hmm. they needed more of our storytelling Absolutely. you know yeah but then having to sort of fight for your moment yeah. to infuse us and our culture and our representation in a way that is, you know, uh, I don't want to say palatable enough, yeah. but 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 in a way that's well received right. in meetings and then on the page and um, it was a process. Yeah. Finding my voice was a process. Trusting myself was a process. Yeah. Being myself at work was a process. You know, I mean, so many challenges. And even when I was at Ebony, you know, there were times where I was like, I feel like I have so much potential and I feel like I have so that much is, to that offer. That is the most challenging and thing. I, I did feel stuck. Yeah. You know? When you feel like I've got so much, but so many restrictions so many restrictions like yeah. i'm feeling like i'm like being boxed in yeah okay so you spoke a little bit about oh by the way i also need to say this okay because you said you're we're talking to people who feel stuck yeah specifically editors yeah. who are in these jobs and just don't know what's next when i was at ebony that feeling of stuckness was so real mm. i was working there in by the way this is in the pandemic i mean not the pandemic ah this was by the way this was in the recession okay so this was a very hard time for everybody right. who was working to hold on to their jobs um, let alone a young person who's seeking to be upwardly mobile who wants to be promoted and yeah. find you know and keep keep working and keep jumping around um, jobs were few and far between people yes. were losing their jobs left everybody and, was left losing and their right. jobs yep and when I was trying to make that leap from ebony to the next thing I interviewed Brenda's at every single 
every single magazine. Wow. And I got turned down. Wow. I interviewed for every single magazine. This, and is, I got, with, this is with experience. This is with the experience of doing 15 people's wow. jobs. I mean, truly, when I got to the other side and I realized I was carrying two departments by myself. And that sounds like an, right. like hyperbole. It sounds like it, it sounds it. like Elaine, stop exaggerating. No. I, and I'm not saying that from an ego place. I'm saying that from that's how few resources we had right. to work with. And I look back at those pages. I was responsible for some issues, like 28 pages. Wow. And um, I couldn't get a job anywhere else mm. because that experience from Ebony did not translate. People didn't know what to do with me. And that was so, that was so hard. Because to your point, when, we, when you feel like you have so much to give, you have so yep. much potential, you've proven yourself. And it doesn't translate. Right. Because of the way that you look, where you come from, right. and that none of that is valued similarly. Yeah. And so it felt like it was so much easier for my peers to move around, to be, to get those jobs. And I thought I would never get that okay. job. I thought I was going to be stuck in that role forever. I thought I would never get out. And at the time it was, I was making so far below the market rate. And I think it is important. Thank you for asking this. I think it's important to talk about this stuff because when people only see these accolades and yeah. the headlines, they assume that you just had this like Yep. This smooth ascension. ascension and that every door opened and that's just not the case. Doors yeah. were closed one after another. And by the but the way that I even got out was someone uh, opening the door for me, going around the system mm. and saying and pulling me in. Mm. And I actually got an, an edit test sent to me through a friend that worked at Glamour. Right. Um, and she said, I will review this. You send that you, you know, and I, she would, she was somebody I sort of like met out at these events and I would right. see her and we both sort of felt like we were like outcasts. Like, I think also, by the way, I didn't feel like a cool girl. I didn't feel like the popular girl wow. coming from Ebony. I felt like a lone ranger. Like mm. I felt like I was on my own. Mm. Um, and so it took like this one other person who also felt like an outsider in this insidery world right. to kind of see me know how hard I was working and 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 pull me in through a back door. That's see, how I no got to Glamour. No one would ever think that. Really? No. Wow. They wouldn't think that at all. Entrepreneurship. You have transitioned, mm -hmm. right? You're a full on entrepreneur at mm -hmm. this point. What was, the, what was that transition like for you and what advice do you have for entrepreneurs? I would say have a plan. I would never advise somebody to just take a leap of faith without right. having a plan. And that's not to say that your plan won't get laughed at by God. And, you know, right. I think you have to leave room for life to surprise you. Yep. Um, and, I, and I do think that you won't always know the fine print mm -hmm. when you're walking in faith, but you should have a blueprint. You should yeah. have a plan. And for me, when I left Teen Vogue, I had already basically mapped out the, the next six months. And I knew that I had income coming in through, I think I left in January through April. Mm -hmm. And I'd already started translating some of what I was doing, not for free, but for my job right. um, into paychecks. Right. And I re started to understand the value of the work that we do that may seem in, like ancillary stuff for yeah. your jobs. Like, you know, as an editor in chief, you're always, doing panels. Right. So those are speaking engagements. Right. You can command a speaking engagement fee right. for that. Um, I didn't even know that. Yeah. You know, so, right. so a few months before I left, I I booked a f my first big speaking engagement. I was like, you can make this much money in one day. <laughs> I've been just telling myself, all right. So that was a big aha moment, just knowing my value, right. like really getting out there and understanding how much money people are out here getting paid for the right. things I'm doing for free, you right. know, under one salary. Um, and then, you know, I, I made sure that I had my, like, what's the one thing that only I can do? What's mm -hmm. the one thing that I know I need to give birth to creatively next? And for me, that was my book. Mm. I I knew that like, you know, I, I wasn't going to jump ship from this major company just to go 
sit at the table at all these other people's companies and just for a paycheck. I wanted to build something on my right. own. And for me, my book was that. It built a platform for myself it that was did. such a, a important springboard for all yeah. these other opportunities that it attracted. So I think, think about what you're building. Yeah. Don't just think about where your next paycheck is coming from. Think bigger. Yeah. You know, what is that thing that only you can build that's yeah. calling on you, you know? And then, yeah, think about who going to pay you yeah. for all the things that you can do right. in the process. Love that. And you'll be surprised. A lot of people, you know, are hiring freelance right. work, uh, creative workers. And um, whether that's, you know, whether you're a writer or a consultant or, you know, you can get brand deals that are quite lucrative. Right. Um, and so I just think you have to be savvy. I personally got a team. Um, I signed with CAA right after, right before, right after I left um, Teen Vogue. And that that is helpful to the extent that you can drum up in inbound business. Right, right. Like they will trans, your agents will transact on inbound Mm. until you have enough momentum traction where and they traction. can then go in yes and when ah. they will start investing real time in you so i think you have to know that when if you are teaming up with agents you cannot rely on them to mm. make your career happen and pop see i didn't know that no it's i assumed you. that they were out there they are at a certain point okay okay but not if you you have to establish yourself and okay. you have to prove your value so I came to CAA with jobs okay. already locked in okay. that then they collected a commission on. And from there, we built a business together. Okay. You know, we set, I, and I'm also the, you have to think of yourself as the CEO yes. of your business. Absolutely. So when you have agents or lawyers and people who are working for you and to support you, you ha you are the one who is driving the ship. Right. You need to set the vision. No one's going to set the vision for you. Yeah. Um, you are the one setting the goals for the team. So you have to be really strategic. I would say like the way that you approach your job working for someone else and everything that you learned inside that infrastructure, you need to apply that to how you run your business. Yeah. Um, I, I try to be really strategic and mm. I look at my life and my career in quarters. I'm mm. like, when I left Teen Vogue, I was like, what do I want to make in that first quarter, in that second quarter? I had quarterly financial goals. Wow. And, I, and my goal was to make as much, if not more, that first year out than I did at the height of my career um, in, my, in my magazine job, in my editor-in-chief job. And I was able to do that in the first two quarters. Wow. Maybe first quarter. Like, And that was because I was so focused. I was so right. aggressive. You had a plan. I had a plan. You had a plan. And I waited until I really had the plan. Yeah. And I, I knew I knew for a while that it was time. Right. And it, I, I was being called to something beyond yeah. those four walls. Um, I was grateful to have a blueprint to follow in, in Harriet. And it was scary to leave, even with the plan, even with this faith, even with that much vision. Mm -hmm. It was so scary, even though I knew what was scarier was staying put. Mm. When I knew I was called to something absolutely. more. Absolutely. You know what I, I mean? I know that feeling. Yeah. I absolutely know that feeling. Elaine, this has been so good. Mm. Honestly. Thank you. you have literally, I feel like you have just like poured your heart out. Oh. And I know that people are going to see this, watch this, listen to this and be so inspired. What's next for you? How can we support you? Oh, well, you drew it out of me, by the way. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, it really is a testament to you. It's not, I'm usually you in this <laughs> dynamic. I'm usually the one like trying to pull, <laughs> you know, the heart and the soul and everything out of out of the next person. But um, what is next for me is what I would say is the culmination of everything mm. that I have ever done. It's the, it's like the why for all of it. It's like, why I sit at this intersection, this unique intersection of all these different worlds. It's why I have the network that I have. It's why I think God put me um, in this position of, I think, privilege and visibility. Um, and that's really to harness it all for the benefit of mothers mm. and families across this country. And becoming a mom changed everything for me. It changed how I move through the world. It changed how I see my role in the world. Yeah. Um, it changed who I feel responsible for. 
I think I've always felt like I've always had this mentor spirit and I'm always like, I've always felt really connected to young people and wanting yeah. to help the next generation. I think being a mom has put me in this new club, this universal sisterhood. Yes. And I realized when I became pregnant and was out here looking for a doctor, just how broken this medical system is mm -hmm. and just how hard it is to be um, a woman bringing life into this world under these circumstances, right. but especially a black woman. Yeah. And even a black woman with the resources and the privileges that I have, I found it very, very difficult to find quality healthcare that made right. me feel safe and that made me feel seen and heard in the midst of a maternal mortality crisis where we are dying three to four times mm. the rate of white women. Wow. America has the highest maternal mortality rate in all of the developed countries in the world. I had no idea. And that's a problem. We don't know that we are living in a crisis and this crisis is only going to continue surging. I think it's by design that so many of us are living in the midst of a maternal mortality crisis and mm. we don't even know. Mm. Um, and so once you know, right. you have to do something about it. And so I um, decided to give birth outside of the hospital with a midwife, black midwife, wow. who really opened my eyes to midwifery as a solution mm. for this maternal mortality crisis. And it's something that um, I would say, in a nutshell, when we talk about this issue, I think either A, people don't know about it, right. or B, they lean away and they're kind of scared off because it's y you hear about it through these grim statistics and you just kind of want to look away and, and hope for the best and just mm -hmm. be like, oh, I hope I survive my, right. my, my birth. But that should not be the benchmark for right. a successful transition into motherhood is to survive it. You should be able to thrive, right. especially in the richest country in the world. And I've found that the, the most important statistic that we all need to know is that 80% of these maternal deaths would be prevented with midwifery care. Wow. 80%. Wow. So this is a preventable crisis. We can, oh. we can prevent these deaths. And so my focus has really been creating greater access to midwifery care. Mm -hmm. Why are we not rallying around this simple solution? I mean, it's not simple, but it's 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 an actionable solution. Right. And so um, basically my advocacy work around this area started right after I had my baby. And I quickly kind of learned that I need to be part of the solution, not just talking about right. the problem, not just raising awareness about this problem. And so I decided that I would start a fund to mm -hmm that to help women and families across this country who do not have access to quality, holistic, culturally competent maternal health care, get it. Because I don't think that you, I don't think that like how much you make should have a de any determinant factor on, on whether you survive birth, yeah. you know? So, um, What's the I name started, of the fund? it's called the birth fund. It's called the birth fund. It's called fund. the birth fund. I started the birth fund this spring. I launched with congratulations. 10, thank you. Um, with ten of my uh, family funders, my founding family funders, which include a lot of wonderful women, um, including Serena Williams and her husband Alexis Ohanian, Kelly Rowland, um, Aisha Curry, um, Savannah James, Carly Kloss, Ashley Graham. Um, Abby Phillip wow. from CNN and Lauren London and each of these incredible women and these families that they represent are not only covering the cost of midwifery care for a family that needs it but they're also leading a digital raise wow. alongside me so we are creating this community support model where it's very one-to-one -one. every woman every family can do something right. to help another woman and family and I sort of piloted this program with just myself on my birthday I was like I just want for my birthday all I want to do is cover the cost of care for another family to have that type of transformative mm. health care experience that allows you to have a dignified birth not just not just surviving your birth which isn't is the baseline but to really feel empowered um, 
and I posted on Instagram. And I was like, if anybody wants to join me, here's the link. It's a little fundraiser on Instagram. Oh, and in 16 hours, we raised $16,000 wow. with no press, no other push, no other post. And we were able to cover the cost of care for not one, but two families. Wow. And so for me, that was the, that was sort of the proof of concept that I needed to say, okay, w people will respond when you give them, when you point them in the direction and say, it, pe people want to help. They, they just don't help. know how. So yeah. we need to create the solution and direct them there. And so it, it, it really, sometimes I think the biggest, most complex problems in this world have really small solutions yep. that we can each pick up and focus on we, if we each just focus on a part yep. of the problem that we can solve, absolutely, we can make a big difference. And yeah. so, and and with the issue of motherhood and births, it's if you can help one family, yeah, survive and thrive through birth, you've done enough, you know. And and Elaine, I just the, my my niece just had a baby, and she's having a really great breastfeeding journey. Oh, good. But I didn't. Right. Mm. And when I look back, I said to my mom, nobody told me when my daughter was in NICU that I needed to be pumping. Wow. Because I didn't have a midwife. Because you didn't. I had yes. no idea. So I had, There's so much they don't tell us. You, I didn't know. About our own bodies. And, and so how to do I this. didn't. It, I didn't have success with that, but that was something I wanted so bad. I'm so sorry. And with like a midwife, it would have been totally different. Yeah. So this is super important work that you're doing. Thank you. I, I mean, am so excited to support it. I am asking all of you to make sure that you support it as well. It's called The Birth Fund. Is it .com? Yeah. TheBirthFund.com. Make sure that we all go there, donate, and support. And Elaine, thank you for being here. And thank for you just for me. all that you do. Thank you. It's I so adore meaningful. you. I adore you. I'm You're just, the best. oh, y'all, I could have went we all did it. We did it. We did it. Thank you. Thank you, this love. Was good. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Fashion and Color Podcast. I want to thank our production partner, PVA Entertainment, the Harlem's Fashion Row team. Thank you so much for your support of Harlem's Fashion Row and for your support of Designers of Color. Please be sure to leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to share this with a friend. Welcome to the HFR movie.